All right, there we go. Okay, so we got two wonderful speakers again. Um, I say that every month because I think they're all fabulous. And our first one is going to be Miss Jackie Allen Grant, and she is from my home state, Missouri. Um, we're many hours from each other, so we haven't actually met in person, but I was able to learn about Jackie and Farm Dog. And as you can see, Farm Dog um, is abbrevi abbreviated um, in P H A R M. And I'll let Jackie explain a little bit more about that. But uh, she, this is something that um, I definitely understand uh, being a partially disabled cattle farmer. My cattle dogs are my other ranch hands, my other farm hands. Um, so being able to have uh, some help without an actual human, which my husband actually goes to work during the day off the farm, um, my cattle dogs help ease my anxiety and stress of having to figure out how to do it all myself, especially someone who can't run or even walk fast. So I'm going to stop sharing. And Miss Jackie, we will let you go ahead. If you're able, if you have enough connection to go ahead and um, open up your camera so that we can see your wonderful face. And then um, once you start talking, I'll go ahead and start sharing the pictures that you're talking about. All right, everybody, Miss Jackie. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yep, Good everything morning. sounds good. Good okay. morning, everyone. Okay. Would you like me to go ahead and explain what PHARM stands for to everybody? Yeah, let's start with that because that's definitely a, a play on words. And, um, I forget the actual term, English term that you call <laughs> that when you... When you do that play on words, so let's start acronym there. Acronym and a play on words, yes. Acronym, yes. there you go. Yes, yes. Um, yes, P-H-A-R-M, Farm Dog USA, uh, the farm part that stands for Pets Helping Agriculture in Rural Missouri. And um, we added the USA to the end of our title in 2012 when we registered with the state of Missouri because we wanted people to realize that we not only place dogs in Missouri, but in other states as well. So how that, how that name came to be actually was um, I uh, passed a farm that had one of those wooden logs out in their yard that was carved. And the husband's a farmer and the wife is a pharmacist. And on that wooden log carved, they had the farm, P-H-A-R-M. And I will admit that I sometimes have an odd mind in thinking of things and I thought uh, wouldn't that be a good acronym for um, this program I'm starting to research and that's how we came up with that name. <clears throat> and our uh, you know our program uh, works with farmers that of course that are dealing with an illness or an injury or a disability and that need assistance on the farm. Uh, we like to call them four-legged farmhands because as you said, Carrie, a lot of times uh, farmers are out there working by themselves. And if they can have that uh, dog along with them to assist them physically, but also emotionally as well on some days, that's a, that's a good thing. I love the idea. I love it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate uh, you asking me to be a part of this group so we can get the word out to more people. We are a, a small group of farmers ourselves. So um, thank you for being persistent and asking us uh, because uh, <laughs> that is appreciated. Yeah, it took us a little while to get here, but we but we got here all for, yes. all for good, legitimate reasons. Yes, yes. Everything happens the way it's meant to happen, I guess. <clears throat> so tell them how, how did this form, how did you decide this is what you were going to do? Well, I um, first was involved with the wonderful program we all know called Agribility. And we were working with uh, farmers with disabilities. And um, that is really not what um, got me started on this, though, because my husband and I have cow-calf pairs and we've always used border collies 
on our farm to assist us in moving cattle and getting them sorted. And, and so when I was uh, at a farm show, I visited with a farmer that had a partial leg amputation and he was telling me uh, about his dog weasel that he said, ever since I, I lost part of my leg, I've relied on him more. And he said, I can sit at my gate. I can send weasel out to get the cattle. And he brings them up to where I need them to be, and I can close the gate, and we can go on our business. Uh, so that's what um, inspired me, in a sense, was this gentleman. And knowing that how helpful dogs are to us, I thought maybe there's something to this. Maybe I should do some research into uh, finding out how we could get some dogs trained to help farmers. And um, registered with the state in 2012 and have uh, the support of AgriBility, which I appreciate because we're both working with farmers with disabilities and want them to stay active and independent doing what they love to do. Now I noticed in some of your pictures that um, are, are, do you still only use border collies or do you train other, other types of uh, dogs? Well, we use border collies uh, for the most part because that's what our trainers are comfortable with. And that's what our trainers have used for, 30 plus years on their own farms. And um, as you know, border collies are very intelligent, but there are other good herding breeds as well. I mean, there's healers, there's Australian shepherds, there's Anna, you know, whoops, did I lose you? <laughs> uh, we no, have a I, lot of, I'm, I see what you're doing. I see what you're yeah. doing. Uh, yes, this is, um, this is Skippy and she's uh, been placed in Georgia in 2022 and she has uh, some shepherd uh, and border collie uh, mix. So we do use some mixes as well uh, as far as the herding side. And uh, of course, on the service skill side, we like to use rescue or uh, shelter dogs, usually Labradors or lab mixes, just because they have uh, that sturdier uh, back, broad shoulders, broad head. But yes, this is Skippy taking care of her cattle in Georgia for a farmer that was injured. Um, he had a big bale uh, fall on his uh, shoulders and head and became partially paralyzed at the time, but is now, uh, thank the good Lord, willing to, to walk and get out with Skippy and take care of his cattle, which he's very grateful for and makes us happy that we were able to help him that way. Now, I, I didn't realize that you um, offered like traditional service dogs as well as cattle dogs. So I love that you're going to um, the shelters and getting rescue dogs for those um, to give them kind of a, a job and a purpose in life. Where are you getting your border collies from? We get our border collies either from a, you know, rescue situation or we've had some that have actually been donated to us, the Border Collies. Uh, this one, actually Skippy here, was one that our trainer, one of their neighbors, had her. And he saw the potential in her. And so we, we took her on. And um, she's turned out to be a wonderful dog. So sometimes we'll take in a donated dog that someone doesn't uh, need anymore, not using. They might not have as much livestock. And so that's where we usually get our border collies and our trainer in Iowa will uh, do some testing on those for us. We have another uh, trainer here near him is in not too far away from me, actually about 45 minutes away that does some evaluation of the dogs. Uh, we want to use the younger, the better. We don't want them to develop those bad habits in a shelter or a rescue situation. So do some testing before that. Um, you had told me this was one of your first clients, correct? That is correct. That is Alda Owen, and that is her dog, Sweet Baby Joe. And she named her. We let her name the puppy. When we were first starting out, we, we let her name uh, Sweet Baby Joe. And Alda is um, visually impaired. She's legally, legally blind. And his, uh, she... Uh, can see somewhat, but not as clearly as uh, as needed for uh, driving. She cannot drive, even though you see her behind the wheel here. She uh, <laughs> did go uh, through some testing with rehab services for the blind. 
she is able to drive the Kubota on the farm. But um, sweet baby Joe was trained to help her uh, not get run over by uh, cattle when she's out there trying to help her husband. Uh, she's explained that, you know, sometimes she can see a, a bush or something out in the pasture thinking that maybe it's a calf. And Joe will be there by her side and will help her to distinguish, you know, that that is a bush. It's not moving. It is a calf or a cow. And she said that um, that this dog really has been life changing for her. If you would would ask her that, she would tell you that. And um, they may have a good partnership. She feels like she's uh, more able to get out and help her husband move the cattle. And uh, she had an experience with a bull one time before she had a dog, was run over by that bull. And she said, now that, I, that when animals, the cattle get closer, uh, Joe will be that barrier between us and has saved me a couple of times. So this was a donated puppy that we started out with. She's about 10 years old now. Sweet baby Joe is. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, Eileen put in the chat, she said, I also think of the prevention of injury when using dogs to herd cattle instead of either on foot or, you know, four wheelers or UTVs. Yes. You know, they can, they can be there quickly. The dogs can be there quickly. And um, the uh, dog you saw a bit ago, Skippy, she's already helped the farm wife and the farmer a couple of times um, when they've been sorting cattle. You know how cattle will turn back at times and think they're coming towards you. And uh, sometimes it happens. But they told me that the, the dogs, we work on that and uh, get in front of them and give the farmer a chance to, to back away and get to safety. So it doesn't work every time, but it is a, a good uh, deterrent for cattle. Yeah. So the farmers can be safer. Now, Jackie, I know that you guys place um, cattle dogs on specific farms for, um, you know, farmers who have disabled challenges, but can farmers, act, like they have a dog, they just don't know how to train it. Can they send their dog to farm dog to be trained? Well, that's one thing we decided early on that we would work with, uh, the dogs that we had selected or that we had donated to us after we evaluate them because, a lot of times, um, a dog that exists on a farm already might have developed some bad habits and um, are a little harder maybe to train out those bad habits. So we like to start with our own. Um, but early on, I thought, well, you know, about every farm has a dog on it. But we like to have younger dogs start out so we can start training at an earlier age and uh, we just decided early on that we'll just use our own dogs that we have uh, tested or evaluated for the program. We do not have our own breeding program and uh, I understand that some farmers do have dogs and if they are dead set on using that dog um, we try not to turn them away. We try to find people maybe they're locally that are in their area that might be willing to work with that dog, but we choose to, to work with the ones that, that we've evaluated. Um, Meg put in the chat um, on, a, on the previous discussion about using a dog to work um, and move cattle instead of like your four wheeler or a ATV. Yes. Meg said um, she nearly rolled her ATV last year chasing a um, <laughs> Henri Heifer she said the angrier that she got, the more dangerous she drove. And it was a wake up call. Um, and I can, I don't do this, but when I ride in the um, UTV with my husband, the seatbelt's on and I've got the oh poop handle. And I'm thinking, I mean, we're going to die out in this pasture, either us or the cow's going to die because it's, it's been too much. So being able to send those dogs out far away to be able to bring them back to you, actually, um, I do believe is, uh, um, more beneficial to the farmer. Right, right. You can, you can stay out of a dangerous situation. Um, we're not saying that dogs solve it all by any means, but you can keep yourself out of dangerous situation and send that dog out in on a long outrun and bring those cattle back in or get down maybe in a ditch or around trees that you can't get to have access to. And those dogs will drive them up out out of those areas and bring them back towards where you need to be. 
not where they want to go. Now, Jackie, I have, we have three um, purebred border collies that we use on our farm um, mm -hmm. and we have raised them all from puppies. Right. I know sometimes like um, border collies, they're, they're so intelligent and they get so bonded with their master or, you know, working partner, as you would say, have you ever had any trouble with um, a border collie transitioning from one farm or one person to another and their loyalty is still over here with their past ma master. Um, I know some will only listen to that one and only. Have you ever had any trouble with those dogs transitioning to a new owner? I know exactly what you're talking about. We've we've not really had much trouble with that, but where we where we do have some issues with that is when we go to place a dog, we go to the farm because we know it's difficult for farmers to come off the farm to receive training. So we go to them. And um, while we're there, of course, the trainer's working with the dog. We're training the uh, farmer, teaching them the commands, how to use them. And in that instance, the dog, of course, is still listening to the trainer. And we're trying to get that transition made over to the farmer giving those commands. So we usually try to stay, oh, about four or five days. And we can come back to if necessary. But uh, we stay that long and teach the farmer those commands and then step away for a while. Let them kind of work with the dog, bond with the dog a little bit. Then we'll come back in and, and work with them. And then after we leave, you know, it's you have to be consistent with your dog. Mm -hmm. Use those commands that we've trained you uh, to use. A lot of the training is of the farmer, not necessarily of the dog once uh, you get them placed but we've not had any trouble with um dogs transitioning and i think part of it is because we go to the farm and help them get used to that area uh we'll break off some of the cattle and try to get the cattle dog broke so they're um getting used to having a dog around of course that sometimes takes longer than what they're we're there for but a consistent um use of the dog will help in that transition. We've had one dog that has returned because I'm sorry for any of you cat lovers out there. Sometimes a border collie gets focused and did cause an injury to a cat on the farm. Uh, that farm decided they did not want that dog. So we took him back and we did a little um, more training with that dog and placed him with another farmer and, and not had any problems there. So we all know about the cat and dog problem. So uh, <laughs> sometimes that's the, that's the only time that we've had some, some issues, but that's a, that is yeah. right. Border collies get so bonded with their, with their owners and focus, but we've had, uh, we're blessed in that sense that the dogs have transitioned well, because farmers are so grateful to receive them and work with them and invite them to be part of their family. Yeah. I, I knew that you had, you would take the dog to the farm and give some um, training to that farmer, but I didn't realize you actually stayed that long. So to make the collaboration work, um, being able to stay those four or five days is probably really essential um, to making the relationship work because the dog's going to know exactly what to do. But if the, the farmer doesn't know the right commands to give in certain situations, it's going to be, end up being a wash. <laughs> that's right yeah so we we feel like it's important to be there uh, with the farmer and help them adjust and any other family members that that are around they need to be aware of those as well if they need to help um, we're we're a small organization and we don't have any corporate funding uh, we run off of donations and fundraisers so those trips to other states uh, add up and sometimes, you know, the farmers are willing to to allow us to stay with them or to feed us a couple of meals, that sort of thing. But we just feel like it's better to go to the farm because it's so difficult for farmers to come off because they have livestock to worry about. They might have doctor's appointments, that sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah we feel that's important. Yeah. OK, let's talk about um, this next picture that I have up here. Go ahead and explain his story. Oh, yes, I love this picture. This is uh, John Inns from Enid, Oklahoma, and his little girl and their dog, Max. And we trained uh, Max, uh, our farmer in uh, 
I'm sorry, our trainer in Packwood, Iowa, Don McKay, worked with Max and um, trained him to help John with his cattle. Uh, John was in a farming accident and left him uh, paralyzed. And he was a part of agribility in making uh, it's all about hope video. And that's how I first met him. But several years passed and just this last year, uh, year in uh, 2022 actually we placed max and he's already been a lifesaver to him he said and he he asked us to train max with the retrieve skill he said i'm going along in my wheelchair and um, sometimes i hit a bump and that phone will fly out of fly out of my uh, pocket or wheelchair and max has trained to retrieve the phone he said he dropped a screw underneath the wheelchair ramp and told Max to get it, get it. And he went and got the screw that he dropped underneath the ramp. But he also has helped him get cattle out of the pond that he couldn't otherwise get to. He said, I'd, I would have had to call somebody if I wouldn't have had Max. And what I really like about this uh, connection is they use him uh, with their cattle, but he's also been introduced to... Um, their family and he's a family dog and sometimes um you know border collies are so intense on their livestock they don't pay attention to the little ones but we try to try to get them socialized so they blend in with all family members but this is a great story they've they've uh, really formed a great partnership this picture here is uh we did a training in sedalia missouri the uh, vocational rehabilitation felt like it was important for their VR counselors to realize what dogs can do for a farmer. So uh, we had uh, a call from Carrie Wilson at the time. She's no longer with VR, but she's actually had us do this two times with VR counselors so they can see how a dog saves a farmer time, energy, uh, can be a helpful hand to them, and we consider it a kind of an assistive device, actually, because mm -hmm. these dogs are assisting these farmers in getting their jobs done and are there for them to uh, help them physically, like I said before, but also emotionally when they have those tough, tough days. So there's two or three farmers there and one of our trainers and, uh, of course, three, three of the dogs there that uh, got a workout. You can see their tongues hanging out there. So. <laughs> Uh, we, we had to take that time to uh, to train, and, and we had lots of good compliments from vocational rehabilitation. They didn't realize the value of having a dog to help that farmer in his day-to-day -day activities. Jackie, um, me being in the position that I'm in, I'm always thinking of uh, what can decrease my, my stress level and just make things easier on me so that I can continue farming. What do you hear from these um, farmers and ranchers that are getting these dogs? How, what are they feeling like, you know, after a month, after six months of working with these dogs on their farm? What are they coming back to you with? Well, actually, we hear a lot of positive comments, which makes the job we do worthwhile. Um, the dog Skippy that we placed in Georgia, um, the husband said, uh, you know, I've fallen in love twice in my life. He said this to his wife and he said, you were my first love and Skippy is my second. He <laughs> said, uh, I said, wow. <laughs> um, he said uh, Skippy helps him uh, continue to do therapy. He said, I'm getting up and I'm walking with the dog and I am going out and doing more, being more mobile because that dog needs me to be to be out there and um, had a farmer that was going through cancer treatments. Um, his dog was actually a Labrador retriever. Wouldn't leave that farmer's side every time that he had a treatment and was resting and, um, you know, was just there as emotional support for that dog. Had a farmer say he'd have to sell his cattle if he wouldn't have received a dog to help him stay on the farm. So, it doesn't solve everybody's issue, but it is an option. We uh, feel that it's uh, maybe overlooked in, by some people 
and that's okay because not everybody's a dog lover but it right. uh it's good to hear those stories that they feel like they can stay active and independent doing what they love to do yeah now jackie big question um how does a farmer with physical challenges receive one of your dogs and uh, what is the cost? Yes, and that varies, to be quite honest. We have a website, of course, farmdog.org, and you can get on there and, and ask that uh, question if you have questions. Or um, it's usually not a farmer that, can, that contacts me. It's usually a spouse or a family member that reaches out to me. We find out what their situation is and what they're actually needing. And we will work with vocational rehabilitation in some states. Um, for instance, Missouri will help pay for the training, but we donate the dog, if that makes sense to you. In Nebraska, they used to do that, but now they will not pay for training. So it varies. We've had some farmers that have done fundraisers we help with fundraisers and ideas. So it varies in the sense that if VR is helping out, that is, is uh, good to help the farmer with those payments. If they are not involved with, with VR or another organization like that, then we work to find ways to um, help them get a dog. We sometimes ask the farmer to donate to help another farmer get a dog. So the price is something that we discuss on an individual basis, actually, depending on um, what their need is, because the border collie might not cost as much as a dog trained with service skills. But we're looking anywhere from five to seven thousand dollar range if you were to put a price tag on the time and energy and food and medications and all the things that go into that. Yes. So I encourage anyone that's interested to visit with us first. And I'm not saying Joe only pays 2000 and Susie pays five. It's just we need to uh, see what organizations they're they're working with. And if they're not working with an organization, we sure want them to get a dog. So we find a way to to get that worked out. Absolutely. Jackie, we're going to put um, your contact information in the email that gets sent out um, with the link to this meeting. But if you wouldn't mind, I know that there's people who love to just immediately look at it. Um, could you put um, farmdog.org and your email address in um, the chat? And then um, we're running out of time for questions, but there's okay. two questions, one from Kevin and one from Julie in the chat, if you wouldn't mind answering those. Sure. Um, Merit is on. I definitely don't want to leave anybody out, uh, but just sure. for the sake of time. Okay, I thank you for that, and I'll, I'll awesome. get my information. Yeah, and we're going to get you all. I know you're out of Missouri now. We want to get you everywhere. We want to get you <laughs> help get everybody a dog that needs it. Well, we appreciate that more than you know. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So for our second speaker, we're actually going to have two speakers this time. Um, crazy thing. So I read the chat during every one of our meetings, and I've heard some um, people kind of throw it out there about Comet training. And I thought, I've never heard about this before. So I went in and looked it up and um, realized, hey, we need to have somebody on our agri-stress meeting. I started digging into it. And as I was digging into it, um, I forget who sent me um, a link to a Comet training. And I thought, okay, well, that's two things coming at me. One during this meeting, and then I get an email that says, hey, you need to be in on this comment training. And then I uh, contacted Merritt and said, hey, how would you like to present for our December meeting? So three things worked out right in a row um, with our comment training. So we're going to let Merritt and Kristen go ahead and start sharing their screen. Um, and I have just finished the comment training. I think it was two weeks ago. Um, another phenomenal resource for anybody who wants it. And we'll make sure you get that information as well. So um, Merritt, I will let you go ahead and take it away. Fantastic. Thanks, Carrie. And can everybody see the screen and hear me? Yep. Everything looks fantastic. Phenomenal. So um, Kristen and I are super excited to be here today and, and um, join your wonderful webinar. So um, 
we're going to talk about Comet, which was a program that's been developed by rural communities and for rural communities called Changing Our Mental and Emotional Trajectory. And today we'll really briefly cover sort of what it is, how it came about, the evaluation behind it, and the kind of trainings that can um, that, that go along with it. Very quickly, I'm Merritt Felzine. I'm here in northeastern Colorado. I'm a fourth generation farmer and rancher, dry land, and I've been part of a community advisory council. And I'm going to ask Kristen to quickly introduce herself since she didn't get a great spotlight on the beautiful flyer. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kristen Churchia. I'm a senior research assistant with the University of Colorado Department of Family Medicine. And I coordinate a lot of our activities with the High Plains Research Network. I'm based out of uh, North Denver, yeah, in Broomfield, Colorado. Great, thanks, Kristen. So comment really briefly is this community-based intervention to activate community members and provide them with language, tool, but most importantly, the confidence to intervene when they notice that someone around them is unwell. And the idea is that we know when people around us are suffering, but we don't always know what to say. And I have a story about that here in just a second. And so the idea is to teach the language, give the tools, practice a bit, and mm -hmm. have that language in your back pocket so that intervention can happen neighbor to neighbor, friend to friend, acquaintance to acquaintance before crisis occurs. So we think of Comet as a mental health intervention that's way upstream from many of the other um, mental health trainings that are available to us. So quick story time. We are a, um, a partnership or a community advisory council made up of all kinds of folks in the Eastern one third of Colorado farmers, ranchers, teachers, retirees, students, uh, managers, moms, dads, you name it, pastors, law enforcement. And we partner with research partners and professional partners at the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Colorado to ask and answer questions specific to the health and the well being of Eastern Colorado, very rural. Typically, you know, the highest percentage when it's a bad number and the lowest percentage when it's a good number around health and um, oftentimes have lack of access to kind of all the things. So, but the community kept saying to our research partners and our friends, we kept saying, you know, well, what about, how do we talk to people about mental health? And one story, two stories actually stand out. One was from a young man who said, listen, I was spending my summers working at Oscar's Bar and Grill in a little tiny Lyman, Colorado, and the harvest crews would come through. And I have this image of this young man who was sitting at the bar, sitting at the table, despondent, head in hands, not doing well. And I could see him suffering, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know where to point him to get help. And we, as a community group, we need to figure this out so that people aren't going to, aren't like, going to be like me standing there thinking, what do I do? What do I do? The second story is our dear friend Sergio, who's working at the Ace Hardware store again in a tiny town. And he said, you know, people come to the counter. I chat with them all day. Every time they come in, we have this chat. I know them well. They're not intimate conversations, but I know them well. And so when I see someone struggling, I too, I recognize it, but I don't know what to say. I don't know how to ask hard questions around mental health because I'm worried about the stigma. So these were sort of these guiding stories within our community group. And so we started, we launched into this big project. And so we used two um, research methods. We used one called appreciative inquiry, which allowed us to go out and seek volunteers who would tell their story of a mental health sort of episode in their life specifically focused on what was the journey sort of into this mental health situation, mental, emotional, behavior, health situation, but more importantly, what was your strategy for navigating your way back towards wellness? And then the second part of this was we used boot camp translation, which was to take all kinds of data, including the data that we had gathered, this appreciative inquiry data, and translate it into something that was meaningful, actionable, and usable in our community. And so that's how Comet came about. We um, understand, and this kind of became our, our language, that our all of our wellness 
lives on this trajectory, right? Like hopefully we spend most of our time over here on the, on the, the wellness side where we are functioning dynamically. We are, um, you know, life is kind of tripping along normally. We have our, our ways of managing our stress and we're, things are under control, but then there's this big continuum of vulnerability. And this comes from all sorts of things, right? Stress, grief, financial issues, um, holidays, uh, winter when it's dark a lot, uh, cold, aches and pains, family situations, uncertainty of the agricultural economy, um, individual mental health tendencies. And so this vulnerable space, we, we recognize that probably each of us sort of leans into that vulnerable space and back out again. The hope is that we have some coping skills that sort of we know how to access in order to move back towards wellness and long before, you know, sort of we tip towards crisis. But comment we feel like is this ability for friends, neighbors, acquaintances, when they recognize that someone is entering into this this um, vulnerable space to activate these friends, neighbors, and acquaintances to be this trigger to change this trajectory. And so this came from our research. We learned that from people's stories that as they were navigating this vulnerable space, whatever was going on in their lives, it was always this conversation with someone this other person, this was one of our findings, that in a caring way that happened in a safe venue, so not the therapist's office necessarily or primary care or on the telehealth of my doctor, but maybe in the parking lot or sitting at the bench at the gym watching our kids' games or at the livestock sale barn. You know, those places where we have these conversations, the parts store, the hardware store that it was these conversations with this other person that impacted the person who was in this vulnerable space and something shifted. Either they knew what to do, they just hadn't recognized the signs and needed to do it, or they didn't know what to do. They didn't realize how bad things were. And by having this caring conversation, they're like, oh my gosh, I hadn't realized things had gotten so bad, but I don't know what to do. And then there was an ability to have a conversation about resources or ways to address what was going on. So Comet sort of is this space long before crisis and long before really wonderful resources that are available when there is um, a crisis situation. So Comet is built around a conversational guide. We in our group, our community group, we just sat down and said, how do we have these conversations? How would we have these conversations? What would they be like? And so we really have these five guiding questions and then a couple of what we say are optional, but really are becoming not so optional. And really the conversations go like this. And Kristen, I'm going to pick on you just a little bit. And we're not going to give you all the language. This is what happens in the training, but they really are, they should found, seem really natural. Sort of this Hey, Kristen, it's good to see you. Gosh, is everything okay? You just don't seem yourself recently. And then I might say, but so how are you? No, really, tell me how you are. I've noticed that you um, haven't been sticking around when we pick up the kids um, at the bus stop like you usually do and having our normal chats. Is there something going on at home or maybe at work? And then question five, you know, I really miss you. I miss those chats and I am a little bit worried about you. Is there a time when we could just sneak away and go take a walk or, you know, maybe we, we, um, I can stop by and we'll just have coffee at the table. So that was super brief. I'm, you know, we're on a, a schedule here, but you, the hope is that you see that these are natural things that we would say in a caring conversation anyway, but the intention is that sometimes it's hard to have that conversation when we're worried, really worried about someone. And we're worried about what's going on. The last two components of this is perhaps an opportunity for the, um, the individual to self-disclose. You know, I've had that happen to me too. I would be happy to share my experience if you wanted to hear it. And then we teach ways to either 
locate resources to exit the conversation in a caring way or to, um, to provide some additional support. Things that neighbors to neighbors, friends to friends, acquaintances, acquaintances would do anyway. So this is a specific guide. Comet teaches these, um, basically these topics with lots of opportunities to figure out what would I personally say in this situation and in that situation. Um, it's a big part of the training. We have lots of scenarios that I think everybody would recognize because they're adaptable. And then people walk away with this little wallet card in their, in their pocket. It's a little cheat sheet that's a reminder of what, what, of what one would say, but also um, as a reminder to intervene, to be brave and to step in and have that conversation when you're not quite sure what's going on. Yeah, so again, my name is Kristen Churchia. And so to get Comet out into communities, we created the Comet Community Training Program. So this program brings together groups of people to be trained in Comet. They learn, as Merritt said, the Comet questions, how to integrate this into their daily situations. And the training includes experiential and didactic sessions. It covers local epidemiology of mental health, uh, what being this other person means. Mm -hmm. It covers the Comet questions, goes through role playing, so everybody gets a chance to practice the Comet questions. Um, action planning and discussions about local resources available in the area. After seeing the Comet community training take off in Colorado and Wisconsin, we also developed a train the trainer program to create certified Comet trainers that would be equipped to conduct their own Comet community trainings in their local communities. Comet provides trainings to fill a gap between nothing and more intense trainings like QPR and mental health first aid. It's not meant to replace, but to provide an entry point and to fill this void. So using this hub and spoke model, we have a train the trainer curriculum so that trainers can learn comment and take it into their local groups and venues. So for example, so the regional trainers then take com comment community training to local venues like sale barns, auxiliary ad groups like lenders or extensions, 4-H uh, lender, 4-H leaders, rotary clubs, school staff, churches, coffee groups, volunteer first responders, and the list goes on. We've hosted more than a dozen train the trainer trainings, and we partner with organizations that connect and support our rural communities. Uh, next slide, please. So we knew that the Comet um, community training was a great program, but to really understand the impact of this training and to share it was a preparing local communities to have these caring conversations and to intervene early on when mental health stress was beginning to show, we did include an evaluation component to this training. So we administer a survey before and after the training to ask about the participants' feedback on the training structure and the content. We also ask about the likelihood uh, to take certain action actions and their intentions to use the comment questions. So basically, we're just really curious to hear what people think about the training. We also ask our comment trainers to complete a field note after each training so that we know uh, as the program team what went well, what needs improvement, and how engaged the group was. Next slide. So this slide gives us a look at the number of trainings and who's present in the room for those trainings. Um, as you can see on the table of the right, 308 people had completed the comment training at the time of this analysis. Trainees come from a variety of occupations, including farmers, ranchers, law enforcement, insurance agents, bankers, pastors, healthcare professionals, teachers, county coroners, retail workers, and many more. So these um, more trainings have occurred since our statistician was able to provide the results on the table on the right. So to date, we've actually trained over 900 individuals in more than 90 trainings throughout Colorado, Wisconsin, Wyoming, and California. Next slide. So these figures look at the likelihood of telling someone that you've noticed a change in their mood or behavior, that's in table one, or inviting someone to tell you about a potentially emotional situation in table two. So you can see that the likelihood of folks engaging in these caring conversations shifts from the pre-surveys, which is that turquoise color bar, to the post-surveys, which is that coral color bar. 
So in short, community members report that the comment training increases their likelihood of engaging um, others in mental health conversations to support social connection and reduce the risk of mental health crises. Next slide. We also look for feedback about the likelihood of using comment. 97% of our trainees reported that they were likely or very likely to use comment in the next three months. So that's that maroon color and the coral color. So we can see here that the intentions of the trainees changed from the pre to the post surveys. Next. As Kristen said, we collect feedback from all sorts of folks who receive the training and from our trainers, it's, it's so valuable. One said, for many people, mental health first aid is too complex and goes too deep too quickly. It expects, it expects too much from the layperson. Some people need a gentler entry point and Comet provides this very, very nicely. Another trainer shared a very similar sentiment, sharing that her father, who's an implement dealer parts guy who knows everyone, as you can well imagine, found Comet completely accessible. He recognizes when people are suffering and he found it a nice way to, for him to remember to engage, to have the confidence to engage and the tools for these um, interactions. So just sort of to kind of give you the, the 10,000 foot view of sort of what's next for Comet, we, um, as Kristen indicated, have been receiving a huge influx of folks who wanting the training, receiving both the train the trainers, and then therefore they're offering the community trainings in their networks. Um, Comet now has materials available in Spanish, and this is directly due to feedback from our regional trainers who've said, if it was in Spanish, we would use it. And so it's there. I'm very excited about that. We um, will continue to, to conduct key informant interviews and hopefully help enhance our evaluation, as Kristen mentioned earlier. And then we're working really hard to disseminate via presentations like this. We're so happy to be here. Thank you, Carrie. And publications and local newspaper articles and the Comet website. We even um, made it into the New York Times. There was a special edition uh, in the editorial and they spent four days out here studying what's going on in rural mental health. So if we have a link, we might throw that into um, comments. Yeah, so, that would be perfect. Yeah. So we always end our trainings with this quote. We love this. This was a contribution from our great team in Wisconsin. Um, this comes from the wonderful Fred Rogers, who sums it up this way. Anything that's human is mentionable. And anything that is mentionable can be more manageable. When we talk about our feelings, they become less overwhelming, less upsetting, and less scary. The people we trust with that important talk can help us know that we are not alone. We love that. Yes, it's from Fred Rogers, but it applies so perfectly for the struggles that we're finding in our rural communities when it's kind of hard to talk about. Um, our feelings sometimes. So we're going to um, wrap up with that so that we can answer a few questions. I want to call out several people who are on today's call, Chad and Jim and Carrie, if there's anything you guys want to pipe in and share real quick. We, I think we have a few minutes. Did we do it? Yes, we, we do. Couple, we do. A couple so minutes. The, a couple okay, minutes for chat, Q&A. Yeah. 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 Um, Meg asks, what strategies have you found effective in recruiting participants to attend the trainings? Because that's, you know, obviously always a big thing is how do you get them here so you can train them? Yeah, and I would love for Jim and Chad to um, to chime in here. So what we're seeing happen, and so I'm going to, this is the disclosure, Kristen and I really focus on the train the trainer trainings, and then we trust our regional trainers to know their communities. And so one of the best ways to do that is kind of start with those gatekeepers that are your buddies who already have inroads with another group of people. Um, so for example, Agribility and Extension is doing this an awful lot. And then they're sort of also sort of reaching out and saying, hey, but we also work really closely with the FSA and USDA and NRCS agents. And so I have a good contact there. I'm going to connect with them and then I'm going to see if we can put a, a community training there. Um, libraries have been a really good place to launch a training. You know, kind of these 
we've found that both subsets of people have been very interested in the community trainings and then also kind of more general open to the public, um, not public, but in like in my small town, how could we engage the public? So Chad or Jim, is there anything you want to contribute to that real quick? I think that's well said, Merritt. Hi, my name is Chad Resmancheck. I'm a behavioral health specialist with Colorado uh, Agribility and Extension here at CSU. And I'm fortunate to be a Comet trainer. And I think one of the things we really tried to focus on is identifying those community stakeholders that have a vested interest in increasing their capacity and ability to better support their communities. So this has really kind of looked like um, getting involved with different organizations and just being able to um, gauge their interests. If they have an interest in wanting to develop these skills, then the great thing about Common is once you're trained, we're able to offer that um, free of cost to anyone that's interested. And so it's just a matter of us and our time and getting out there and being able to do that. And we found it's been, um, I think, very well welcomed. And it's incredibly inspiring as a trainer to be able to see people's responses and how much they have increased their willingness to recognize and respond to people when they need it. And so um, some of the organizations we've worked with to do this are like ag mentor programs. As Merritt mentioned, we've done it with some extension staff onboarding and we're able to offer it at the extension um, employee forum for the first time this last year. And it's just, again, looking for community organizations that are interested in wanting to, you know, that recognize that there's needs in their communities and want to be able to to reach out and do the right thing to help people. And with you know 90 minute investment of time, they get that. So can't say enough about it. Chad did a nice job of, of kind of modeling this hub and spoke model that Kristen spoke about earlier, where if we can get into a group and provide the train the trainer, now your group has X number of regional trainers that you, you know, sort of in your networks, you have this group of folks who are on the ground ready to go and offer these trainings, which is exactly what Chad is saying that he's doing. So, and yeah. if you guys look, um, Kristen has put a couple things in the chat. She's put uh, the email, which go down. There was a typo, so use um, the the last email that she used. And then up above, she's also put um, the link to that New York Times article in the chat. Yeah, and there's a couple of questions about um, bringing Comet to somebody's community. And Merritt and I are happy to set aside time to meet with you individually to talk about that. Um, we do the community training program. We also do a train the trainer. And starting next year, we're actually going to be offering virtual training. So we'll be doing free community trainings. The first one is in January, I believe on the 18th. So we can send you information to get registered for those if you want to see what Comet's all about and learn how to, to do the Comet questions and statements, so. Perfect, looks like there's gonna be lots of interest in that um, from what the chat shows. Awesome. That's awesome. And I love that I got to take it prior to um, you being able to um, be here today so that I would have some kind of understanding of what it is. So I. Um, I, I have so many trainings under my belt. I want to do them all. I want to understand them all and then group them all together um, because every situation can call for something different um, with that. So I, I always have this wealth of knowledge in my head now when a situation comes up. And what's really great about that, Carrie, is that, first of all, it's wonderful that people are getting so many trainings, right? Because they all build and they complement each other. And in fact, we've had groups say, gosh, it's really great to offer the Comet training, but I'm so glad I have Safe Talk or Mental Health First Aid in my back pocket too, because there's bits and pieces of that in this situation that were helpful versus when I'm doing those, there's bits and pieces of this that are helpful in that situation. We're not saying that's the way it has to be. You know, and I think Chad, you do that too. And Jim, I know that you do that too, where it's just like, oh, to answer that question, I have these extra resources, but it's not required. And this is a great starting point. And it's, we believe that, you know, we kind of talk about upstream downstream stuff that comments a way to get started and all kinds of people can be involved. And then that opens the door. The crack is now there. And now I'm not as afraid to take mental health first aid, or I'm more interested in some of these other trainings and I, and you just build your network. Yeah, I totally agree. I see um, Kristen's answering some questions um, in the chat. This is perfect. This is what this is all about is this collaboration that comes afterwards and, and helping, helping get it out there. Um, 
Is there anything else that you guys would like to add that wasn't in your, your presentation, your PowerPoint? Well, I'm going to share a story um, from a friend of ours who actually helped us develop Comet. So he is a professional. He's a mental health counselor. He has run a, um, a center in southeastern Colorado for a very long time. He's like the go-to guy for a very large region. And he says about Comet, he He's developed so many amazing things. He's got a coffee shop and he talks about the coffee shop project and Comet is in, engaged there. And there's all kinds of things we can tell you his stories. And he's in the New York Times article quite a little bit. But one of the things that he says, which I think is so cool, is that every time he offers the community training, so that 90 minute training for just whatever, you know, group, group of subset of people, he tells them each and every time he says, listen, I'm but one guy, and this is a huge area. And um, I now kind of unofficially deputize you to be my eyes and ears in the community because I can't be the eyes and ears in the community. And I guarantee to you, my new eyes and ears in the community, that if you need me, here's my cell number you call between these, between these hours. I will be your backup guy. I will be one of those resources, but I'm going to rely on you to be my eyes and ears in the community. I need you to be watching out for each other. And so he walks away thinking that's 10 more people who are watching out for the health of my community that I won't, am not going to be able to, to see or engage with. And so every time he does that, he's got 10 more, 12 more, eight more people who are his eyes and ears in the community. And um, so he just feels like this you know, his hub and spoke just grows. So we love yeah, it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, thank you, Chad, for putting that in. That's great. Such yeah, a great I just tool. clicked on that too. Yeah. You can never have enough resources, as you said, Merritt. I mean, the more knowledge you have, the, the um, better spokesperson, the better help that you can be for the rural community where there just isn't a lot of help. Um, and being the right kind of help is essential. Yeah. I guess the other thing that I will add, since we have just a couple of minutes, is that there's no set um, answer to what are our resources, because you know what, in each and every one of your communities, the resources are slightly different. Yeah. And so that's part of the conversation is to identify what those resources are. So this is a situation in which we need a resource, we need someone, we need a way to sort of really do address the issues that are at hand, what are our resources? And in some cases, they're not a mental health clinic or a primary care. Maybe they are, but maybe there are others that people are gravitating towards. And so that's a really valuable conversation in the community to identify those those, those really important hubs for where people do go for yeah. help yeah. and support. All right. I want to thank all three of our speakers today. Um, as always, you guys are going to get an email uh, within a day or two with all of their contact information, the link to uh, the YouTube recording that we're going to send out that you can pass on. Um, and then feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any question about today's presentation. I do have two quick announcements. Um, one, this year we should not have to... Um, re-register for 2024's meetings. Um, we've got all that worked out and um, all of our grant information is the same. So we can just keep the meetings um, going without having to re-register. And then um, let me, I need to bring up, so our agri-stress, here it is. Um, we are growing. Our agri-stress response helpline um, is growing. So I have a short little slide that I want to share with you guys um, that we have added. There it's showing up. Um, so look at this. We, we would love to go nationwide. Here are all of our states that are funded for the Agri Stress Response Helpline. Um, we just, we love that we are um, growing and getting the help out there for, um, for our farmers. So, uh, I think I just lost it. Well, dead gum. Uh, here it is. Um, there we go. So, if any of you are new to the AgriStress Helpline, um, it is a 
uh, toll-free line that is specific to those who live or work in um, agriculture or the rural community. And we all know that sometimes um, it's not just like a generic depression that happens with our farmers. It might be situational. So uh, drought, um, they don't know how to do their taxes, you know, things like that. So whenever they call the hotline or the helpline, we are going to have specific resources for those farmers. So um, AgriSafe has curated resources for each of these states for if they say, this is what I'm having trouble with, um, they may not, may not need to go specifically to a mental health provider. You can say, you know what? You're a great farmer. You're a terrible business businessman. I'm going to get you somebody at the extension office who's going to help you work out a business plan. And then poof, all the stress goes away because now they have um, a resource to help them. So it's all those kind of things um, as well. But we're just happy to um, grow, be growing so much. And then let me just double check. I thought there was one more thing. Nope, that was it. Um, we just added Washington, Montana, and um, Colorado. So we would love for you guys to pass that along and hopefully we can get this thing na nationwide in the next um, few years and get that help out there. Awesome, okay. And Tara has um, put in, um, if there's any questions about the helpline, go ahead and contact Tara at agrisafe.org. It's T Haskins at agrisafe.org. And there you go. Okay, everybody's answered it. All right, so that'll be it for today. Look for that email to come out um, in the next 24 hours or so. And I thank you again. Everybody have just a blessed holiday season. And then we're gonna see you in early 2024. Bye, everybody.